So the silver birch tree, Betula varicosa, is the one species of trees when we talk about gemotherapy extract, where we actually use the seed in an extract, the sap in an extract, and then the bud in an extract. Each are made into separate gemotherapy extracts, but each have a tonifying action and some effect on the kidneys. And that's what we're here to talk about today. We're going to take a look at each one of those as extracts. We're gonna look at the plant as a whole, and then we'll have Megan's take on the Asian medicine perspective. I'm Lauren Hubele. I'm a health coach, I'm a gemotherapy expert, and I'm here with two really smart colleagues. Terry, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Terry Brooks, glad to see you all here today. I'd like to say that nature is my guide and my therapy. I like to nourish myself with the wild, weedy, common plants that live around me, and I like to teach other people how to do the same thing. Oh, beautiful. And Megan, how about you? So good to see you today. It's great to see you, Arn and Terry, and everybody tuning in. My name is Megan Lamp, and I practice Japanese acupuncture and gemotherapy. Wonderful. So today, we're going to have Terry introduce the silver birch tree to us. Terry, what can you tell us about the tree? Well, Betula varicosa has often been called Betula pendula also. It means, the varicosa means that it is characterized by warty growths on the plant, on the tree. That term is also used for skin conditions, by the way, which I find very interesting. It is a pioneer species, like other birches, the first likely to appear after the Ice Age in Europe. It's a national tree of Finland, and then the most populous tree, both in the Scandinavian countries and, and in the Alps. It's native to Europe and mainly growing in southern part of Europe, it grows mainly in the mountainous areas, otherwise pretty much generally anywhere. Except I, I would like to talk about some of the differences um, in this tree compared to the common birch. The, this tree is a bit taller than common birch. It can grow 50 to 90 feet tall. Its habitat is different. It loves to be in full sun, dry soil, unlike the common birch, which is, which is in a wet condition. Like the other birches, the catkins have both male and female on the plant at the same time. Other differences are this birch has white bark, but it is characterized by these black diamond shaped markers that are, or fissures near the base of the plant. The shoots are usually rough with small warts on them. Again, that varicosa. And the leaves of this plant, um, different than common birch are much broader at the base where it attaches to the stem and more pointed at the far end of the leaf. These leaves are sticky with some resin on them when they first bud out. Common birch does not have that resin. These twigs are smooth, whereas common birch, the synonym for that was downy birch, so that has a little more texture to it. This birch was not native to North America, so it was an introduced tree and it is currently considered invasive in several states, including Wisconsin, Maryland, Washington, and Kentucky, as well as much of Canada. I like this tree because it supports such a wide variety of, of life, let's put it that way. Birds, animals, and insects. Some studies have shown that there are at least 500 different um, moths and butterflies and insects that are feeding from the leaves or other parts of this tree. Well, we have a bird here that seems to be liking silver birch tree, so there we go. Um, while you tell us about the historical uses, I think I'm going to move my bird. So can you share a little bit about that, Terry? Sure, I can. The silver birch has had a lot of practical uses historically. It's used much for lumber and pulp, like many birches. This birch also is used in the race course jumps, in um, horse racing, for example. It's used in plywood, veneers, kitchen utensils. Native Americans used it as a cast for bone setting. Um, babies' cradles, shoes, sleds, wigwams, canoes, food vessels, because it was said to reduce spoilage or prevent spoilage. So then, a 
right there again, we see a general birch protection kind of theme. It was used for besom brooms, which are birch twigs that are attached to a handle of another kind of tree. And they were used mainly by pagan and Wiccan um, people that used them to sweep out the negative energy in an area where they might have a ritual. The Aboriginal people used birch and they also um, say that this is one of two plants that is considered sacred by uh, mankind uh, by Winnebuju, who was one of their big folk heroes. I, that's not even the right term for him. Um, he, has, he goes by many names in many native cultures, Winnebuju, Nanabuju, different, many, many different spellings. He's considered a trickster. He's often seen as a shapeshifter, a rabbit, for example. We see that in many cultures that rabbit is trickster. Um, there are a lot of tales that you can read about, about this particular character and involving the birch tree. The bark of this tree is high in potassium and it's been used for emergency food throughout the years. I read that during the Civil War, this bark probably saved hundreds of lives of Confederate soldiers. And it was said that for years after the war, you could see the path of the retreat of these soldiers by how the trees had been stripped of their bark. That was pretty fascinating. The cone, leaves, bark, sap, and twigs have all been used by many cultures for medicine. The part that I have been experimenting with most recently is the birch sap. And I had no clue when I first tapped a birch last year just how much sap you get from a tree. I thought I might get a pint or a pint and a half, so I tapped four birch. And I was getting gallons and gallons from each tree. I mean, every half an hour, I would go and put another jar there. So I'm peddling birch water <laughs> around my area. Um, this birch water sap has about 1% sugar in it. And it is a common commodity in mm. Scandinavia and Russia that you can buy fresh in the spring, considered a general tonic. In herbalism, we would call it a depurative, which means it modifies disordered processes of nutrition and it eliminates morbid material from the blood and lymph. It rejuvenates the whole body. And I found that to be so true. It was almost like I was addicted to it. I'd have my glass of birch water in the morning and it has this very, because of the salicylic acid, it has a very mild winter green kind of coolness at the back of your throat. And it definitely does clean you out. Um, the sap ferments very quickly because of that sugar. So in many countries, they will let it ferment and use it for beer or wine or they will chemically stabilize it or freeze it. I have some in my freezer right now. Um, the Druids, I thought this was interesting. The Druids felt this tree was, was a dual personality, if you will. It had double energy. So they think male, female, sun, moon, heaven, earth, those kinds of things. And to them, it symbolized the path which energy takes, descending from heaven while our human aspirations rise. This um, was seen to be the going up to the threshold between this world and the next. And in fact, in Siberia, they called it the sky ladder because this glistening white tree could be seen as a ladder for them while in trance to ascend and contact spirit. Wow, lovely. You can tell I love this tree. Yeah, yeah, I do too. And I fell in love with it even more while I was listening to you. So what, what do you know that, about the potential of medicinal uses for this tree? What, what have you gained? Sure. Well, the tree has a high fluorine content and many cultures have used that as a toothpick, the little twigs as a toothpick or even a toothbrush. And that fluorine provides a chemical block to the bacteria that create cavities in the mouth. So, and it can also remineralize the teeth. We talked a little bit about that with common birch. Also, it has xylitol in the twig that also prevents, prevents tooth decay. But interestingly enough, as you have an infection in the throat, that streptococcus is going to go through the eustachian tubes into the ear, and it often causes those childhood ear infections. So this will help in that area. One of the most fascinating things I did, reading a little bit more about this, um, 
it seems that in several European countries, they are planting this tree and other birches near hospitals because the aerosols from the tree help with kidney problems. So whether it's transplants, kidney disease, dialysis patients, they are strategically planting this tree around hospitals for that purpose. I think this, this plant is uniquely situated to gently and thoroughly move the sap of our human body, whether it's the blood or the lymph, just as the sap moves in the tree in the springtime. Wow, wow. Terry, you know, you just reminded me in Baden-Württemberg in Germany, they have children's playgrounds that are made um, from created birch forests. And they have been purposely planted and the, the playground equipment is integrated with the trees and made from the birch trees as well. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Wow, I just I connected that. That's amazing. I'm sure that it is very purposefully planned. That wasn't by accident. And it's, they're also beautiful just to sit in for parents, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, so now, Terry, we're going to let you take a rest. That was a lot of information for you. And Megan and I are going to tag team back and forth, talking specifically about the actions of the bud um, as an extract, the seed, and, excuse me, the bud, the sap, and then the seed. So when we look at the bud, um, the primary action of the extract made from the bud of silver birch tree is a tonic, as all of them are, but a tonic on the immune system and the respiratory system. It has an anti-inflammatory effect on the mucosal lining in the respiratory system, and is particularly good at helping the body be resistant to flus and viruses. It, it also inhibits the production of histamines in the body, so those that have seasonal allergies or are in, are prone to respiratory or digestive um, allergic reactions, silver birch would certainly be something that could be useful. The secondary action is as a kidney tonic. So it's a mild diuretic effect on the kidney, different than what I'm going to talk about with silver birch sap. The sap is the primary action is on the kidneys. With the birch bud, it's the secondary action. So in this diuretic action that the bud extract does uh, provides, it improves the elimination of toxins on a cellular level, such as uric acid. But what's very interesting is it doesn't increase the volume of urine. And um, but what it does is create uh, is create a more dense, um, wasteful product urine. So there's there's more concentration of waste products. The indirect effect of all of these actions is an increased metabolism. And, and this is, is um, seen because all of a sudden the body can now perform better because the elimination of waste have um, improved. So when I look at the bud of silver birch, different than when we talked about common birch, we're talking about people from six years old to 30. And there isn't a hard cutoff on 30. It could be 35 year olds would benefit from it. But these people would have a moderate vitality um, and they're wanting to optimize elimination and looking to provide general drainage and detoxification. Most often these folks will have a slowed metabolism, which they could, could be seen as a little bit of weight gain, particularly around the middle, some sluggishness, or localized inflammation, like an elbow that just um, doesn't quite have the mobility that you would like. These aren't individuals that have serious deteriorating organ issues. Um, although silver birch buds could be helpful, that's not the extract I would go to. These are people that were just trying to optimize what already works. Um, and anyone over 30 or, or but would look to common birch for similar purposes. Acutely, I use um, silver birch buds with black currant for issues involving breast tissue. So if there's any inflammation of the breast, it's been very useful um, in mastitis cases. 
and in convalescence for flu and colds, along with something for the bronchi and lungs, such as hazel or hornbeam or lithi. In my practice, I primarily use it to support elimination. And so this would be fairly early on in someone's case, and it would be good for um, stool types that are on the Bristol scale, three to 4.5, and these folks have medium to high vitality. So again, a general drainer and detoxifier, helping remove move states of acidosis, not a deep um, um, restoring extract for um, degeneration, okay? So Megan, how do you see this with the Asian medicine lens? Yes, well, I think what Terry said about supporting life and rejuvenating the body is just how I see this. Um, it's interesting what Terry was saying and you were commenting on about building playgrounds out of birch because we know that uh, the buds support lung and the respiratory system and lungs partner large intestine and the digestive system but we know secondarily that it supports kidney and we know through the Asian medicine lens that kidney supports our ability to develop properly through childhood and then all of our further processes, you know, reproduction and starts to decline as we age. But it seems like what we would want for our kids when they play is just something that would support their proper development. So that's a beautiful thing. In the Asian medicine lens, yes, uh, kidney supports the upper, I'm sorry, um, birch supports the upper respiratory system in its bud form and secondarily kidney. Um, lung is the primary um, energy at play with silver birch buds. Lung is our most outer, most exterior energy in the body. It's where the interior and the exterior of the body meet. And we know that it's very involved in making what we call postnatal chi, which is the chi that the body makes from food and fluid and breath. But interestingly, lung then takes that chi and it spreads it to the other organs, keeping them nourished and lubricated. As Terry said, moving the sap of the body. Lung in Asian medicine is considered our upper source of water and its nature is to descend. It provides chi and it provides lubrication for the other organs. So there's an old saying in Asian medicine that the chi is raised up by the digestion or the spleen and then it's sprinkled down to the rest of the body by the lung. Its secondary effect on our kidney chi, which is our most root and congenital uh, chi, is very much at play here too. That's the chi that, again, controls our development through childhood and all the rest of the phases of our life. It's very aligned with our DNA and what we inherit from our parents. And that operates as a savings account for us as we move through our body. So we want our kidney chi to be strong. Kidney also, though, helps to oversee fluids. So we can see the lung and chi, uh, the lung and kidney connection with fluids is very much at play with silver birch buds. Uh, it oversees the fluid movement and metabolism in the body, filtering and cleaning the system. So we know that it's a general detoxifier. The relationship between lung and kidney in silver birch buds is very much at play in upper respiratory challenges. We've talked about this with a few other extracts, how lung controls the respiration, but how kidneys ability to grasp the breath is very important. So it supports and roots and grounds our breath. Uh, we know that lungs nature is to descend, but that has to be supported by strong kidney energy. If the kidney energy is weak and the lung energy doesn't descend properly, again, we might see some upper respiratory system, uh, symptoms asthmatic type things, shallow breathing, inflammation, stagnation in the head and chest. And we know that lung opens into the nose and the throat and kidney opens into the ears. So again, when lung and kidney are asking for support, we're gonna see some heat, maybe some inflammation, something maybe blocked, congealed fluids, phlegm and inflammation in those areas. Interesting. Wow, there were so many nuggets of information in that, Megan. I'll even have to replay this to catch each one of them. Thank you. So we're going to move on to that sap. And Terry, you alluded to this um, practice of drinking the sap itself. And this is also done in Germany and France. And so actually, when I taught in those areas, this idea of having it be an extract 
was a little intriguing to them and um, a little bit of pushback about like, hmm, you know, we drink this whole as it is, we don't need to make an extract of it. And that was all fine and well until one of the boutique producers that I taught said, you know what, I'm gonna give it a try and then compare this, the sap itself with the extract. And she had just amazing results from people um, as an extract. So remembering that when we use it in gemotherapy, it has been diluted and it's processed and it's not diluted to the degree that our other gemotherapy extracts have been, but it is. And actually the sap is technically not does not contain meristem cells so the action slightly different but important to note this tonic action serves as a diuretic just like the juice does and and this um, supports the removal of fats and toxins and minerals in, that build up in an unhealthy level the indirect action just like the buds is on metabolism because when waste products are moved on the metabolism can improve. So the person I see who needs silver birch sap could be any age, very young infants, a week or two old to mature adults. And what's important though, is that they have the vitality to tolerate the strong diuretic effect of this extract. And so we just need to go easy when we start it, make sure it isn't making them more tired or exhausting because then we're, we're ahead of where their body is. Specific symptoms I look for that indicate this extract of, of the sap would be useful would be any skin conditions. It is the first extract I always give. Um, and then if it's eczema, it's always sap and we don't move on because anything else would aggravate the eczema. Even though there are extracts, that will help with eczema later on. We don't begin with them, they're too deep acting. Chronic dryness of skin and hair. Any adult who deals with a buildup of fats, the lipids, and it, particularly those where it might exhibit as cellulitis, okay? In the spring, it could be used for cleaning. So it could just be a ritual for three months, taken alone, taken with black currant, um, and it could be something you do every year. Acutely, I like to put silver birch sap to use for acute skin inflammations, those unexplained rashes or the explained ones that come up, but acutely. Any loose stools that arrive acutely, and it's excellent as part of a post convalescent um, surgery protocol. It, it helps if you put it with lingonberry and black currant, you're restarting everything in the body. You're helping get those um, um, chemicals out and the medications out of the body and getting the intestines and the kidneys back up. I use it a lot for moms who have had C-sections, but for any adult who has just had a surgery. And then elimination wise, this is where silver birch comes in for the most part in my practice when we're at that stage two of restoring immunity for any stool type and for any vitality type. So that's how I'm using it, Megan. It, when we look at it with the Asian medicine lens, how might you see this? Yes, so similar to what you were saying, I think it is important to note that the sap and the seeds are both fairly significant tonics. Um, and they're tonics from an Asian medicine lens because they build what we call kidney fire mm. or the fire of life. So the kidney and heart energy are the fire and the water of life in the body. And they kidney fire or the fire of life is the root of what we call the triple burner in Asian medicine. So if we think of the chi in our body as moving through a river or a stream, the kidney fire or the fire of life is like an ocean. So it oversees all the other functions. So there does have to be um, an ability, like Warren was saying, of the body to be able to handle that extra oomph. Well, if we think about the um, image of a river, that the water level 
needs you need to be able to tolerate a rising or an increasing of vitality and a little bit of a pushing of the system like that and when that is called for it can really be miraculous yeah. for many people uh, so if we back up from an asian medical lens the sap uh, supports the kidney and the spleen stomach it's a tonic for the spleen it supports spleen's ability to break down the food and fluid properly and then raise that food chi up to the lung where it then joins with the breath and makes the chi for our body. We've talked about that soup pot image. And then the lung spreads that chi to the rest of the organs, keeping the organs and the skin properly lubricated. So when we look at digestion, this understanding of our digestion and the production of our postnatal chi helps us and allows us to see how the sap supports metabolism. Uh, it's a balancer for those suffering from sometimes an urgent or a loose stool. If the spleen can't raise the chi up to the lung properly, the stool may be loose and possibly urgent and maybe with some undigested food in it. We're not going to see the normal cycle of digestion. It's going to just be a quick elimination. As far as our skin goes, again, if the chi is not ascending to the lung properly, which is spleen's job, the lung can't properly lubricate the skin. Remember, the lung is our upper source of water. We talked about that, and its nature is to descend and lubricate the skin and the organs. So they say after the chi is raised up, the lung sprinkles it down. Kidney is considered then our lower source of water, cleaning and filtering the blood and fluid in the system. So when both lung and kidney, our upper and lower sources of water are supported, we can see how the sap really addresses the skin, dry type skin things, uh, hair, eczema, all of that so effectively. And we can see with its general detoxification and support both of our uh, upper and lower energies, why it would really be uh, productive when it's called for, for by somebody in any stage of life. Beautiful, Megan. And, and I think it's important to note if you happen to try silver bird sap or you gave it to a client and, and it wasn't received well, that doesn't mean that will always be true. As you work with it, other extracts, you can go back and give it another try. So at this point, I want to talk about the seed. And thanks, Megan, for mentioning the strength of the sap in the seed. I want to emphasize the fact that with the seed, at this time, we're only microdosing it. So everything I'm talking about occurs with one to three drops on, directly on the tongue and generally given in the morning. Because if we take this seed later in the day, the, the effects can be stimulating and could disrupt sleep. Although it, by taking it early in the morning, its effects actually improve sleep in most people because its primary action is on the central nervous system. It's an adaptogen for mental stress, focus, and memory. And it's a strong protector of dopamine. We all need this <laughs> extract none of us are operating with enough dopamine um, getting to the right places in our body. And dopamine plays such a central role in so many functions. Besides just our mood, it, it, it's our sleep and it's our attention, it's our cognitive skills. It, it controls nausea and, and digestion, um, movement and emotion and, and um, our ability to read and retain the knowledge. So I see silver birch seed for everyone. However, anyone who has symptoms that originate in the central nervous system that you know of would be a candidate. Anyone that is a highly complex case where I would need to jumpstart communication between organ systems, I use silver birch seed. So it improves focus and concentration in students and elderly, only children over six years of age. It improves mood, motivation, particularly with those with mental or physical lethargy. And I've even seen it reduce or um, resolve mild tremors. Mm -hmm. So that's silver birch seed. 
from the gel therapeutic lens. How about you, Megan? What does the Asian lens bring us? Yeah, thank you for bringing up the communication between organ systems because that leads very, just perfectly into how I see it from an Asian medical lens. Because interestingly, uh, when we talk about the brain from an Asian medical lens, it, we're not talking about it the same way as we are in our Western mind. In our Western culture, we look at the brain as a command station or a hub of where all the cognition and the memory is happening. And, and that's not quite the same. Asian medicine looks at memory and mental clarity and the functions we attribute to the brain as supported by several energies in the body, uh, primarily heart, kidney, and spleen. So anytime we talk about the brain, we've talked about how a uh, kidney is the meridian very closely aligned with the brain. So yes, of course we are talking about kidney, um, but it's important that when we're talking about the brain in Asian medicine, it requires a little bit of differentiation to see what kind of support the body is asking for. Um, so if we look at heart, it supports the heart energy. We call the hot heart the monarch of life because it oversees the organs and it houses the mind. So heart supports our implicit memory. So it supports the things that we're not purposefully trying to remember or the tasks that we do each day that we don't often need to think about. So anytime we're talking about the brain and we're talking about it in relationship to the heart and our implicit memory, we're talking about things like, you know, washing a dish or putting on our shoes or swinging a baseball bat, things that we don't typically think about when we do them. Uh, if we're talking about how the brain is related to the spleen energy, again, we know it's related to our postnatal chi production, and that controls our ability to focus and concentrate and remember. So when you mention students, Lauren, that's very interesting because in my practice, I often see the spleen energy is very challenged in students or maybe executives that are reading and studying and memorizing a lot. As a quick side note, remember that spleen in the production of our postnatal chi is responsible for the breakdown of food and fluids. Um, so if we are taking in food and fluids that might be challenging for the body to break down, then we're giving spleen a doubly hard job and we can sometimes see the result of that in our concentration and memory and ability to focus. Uh, and it's brain in relationship to kidney, um, also, it's similar to spleen, but we know that kidney grasps the energy. We've talked about that with respiration. So again, supports our ability to uh, think clearly and memorize, but in a different way. So the spleen supports our ability to focus and memorize in the moment, and kidney then grasps that chi. Just like with the breath, it supports the breath and pulls it down, and we get a deep, full breath. Again, it grasps that information so that it supports our long-term memory. I think everyone needs silver birch seed. I've, yeah. I've come to that conclusion and um, I, I certainly use it a lot. I began using it when I was um, writing my last book and I tend to keep going right back to it when I'm working on projects. It's very good at helping keep focus and give my body the support it needs during those times. Especially so, in a sustainable way. Focus in a sustainable way. Yes, exactly, without exhausting. Yeah. Exactly. So, Megan, if someone wants to learn more about Asian medicine, where would they go? Yeah, so there's a great book uh, that breaks down Asian medicine is very readable called The Web That Has No Weaver. If you'd like to find out more about my practice or Asian medicine and gemotherapy from an Asian lens, visit my website, acculemp.com. Perfect. Terry, how about you? Where would someone go to learn more about trees? Well, I didn't have this book last time, but this is Diana Beresford Kroger's Arboretum America, a mm. philosophy of the forest. And she can tell you why each tree is important, not just to us, but to all the other creatures that share this space with us. Beautiful. Beautiful, thank you. And if you want to learn more about gemotherapy, you can find out all kinds of things on my website, laurenhubelay.com, um, where I have blog posts, um, information on my books, 
and classes for you to, to study gemotherapy yourself. Ladies, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, Lauren. You.